At this point, what can't be said about Cam Levins? He's a Canadian marathon record holder, an Olympian, an NCAA champion. Even his training as part of our sports folklore as rumors of monster mileage really dominated early conversations during his time at Southern Utah. Recently, Cam, a Hoka One One and polar athlete coached by two-time Canadian marathon champion Jim Finlayson, has captured our attention once again, posting larger-than-life workouts on his Strava account, including a solo 62-12 half-marathon time trial. What both we and he didn't know when he ran that was that he would get a spot on the line of what is being billed as the greatest marathon of all time, the 2020 London Marathon happening October 4th with a select small field including the much-talked-about battle of the best, Bekele versus Kipchoge. Yes, Cam will be able to qualify for an Olympic spot in this race, but with his training experience and goals, that really becomes a smaller subplot, as we'll get to see just what Cam is truly capable of on that day. You're listening to The Terminal Mile. My name is Michael Rokas, and this week, we're joined by Cameron Levins. It's the marathon that is is always billed as like the greatest marathon on earth. And I think that this year it might actually be the greatest marathon on earth. Take a look at that field. What maybe a lot of people don't realize is that you are actually part of that field as well too. We're just a couple of weeks away. How are you feeling about, about the London marathon? How are you feeling about your prep? And I mean, like, like maybe it's, it's too soon and I can, I can see if you don't want to want to answer it, but like, how are you feeling, like time wise, going into it? I mean, I'm I'm pretty excited. Uh, workouts have been going really well, so um, yeah. I mean, I think all the hard stuff's kind of over at this point, um, and it's just about you know making sure I get to the start line still healthy. But uh, yeah, I mean, this whole build up to London was kind of a surprise, and uh, I'm I'm glad things have been going well because we've kind of just ramped it up the last uh, few weeks. I mean, I think I got in maybe five or six weeks beforehand. So it's uh, been an interesting build for sure. So when you, when you ran that, that 62 minute half, you know, uh, a few weeks ago, at that point, did you know that you were in London? Uh, no, I did not. Actually, <laughs> um, I was just doing it. Um, uh, well, in part because we just wanted to do something. And also, um, I was looking at maybe trying to um, get on the world half team. <laughs> for Canada, um, and I just I, I couldn't find any um, you know halves available to actually race. So we we're hoping that might work combined with um, my time earlier in the year. Um, but then two days later, I was into London, and so we we're like, oh well, never mind. I guess this is <laughs> this is the plan now. Yeah, no, we're just doing that to test things out, and uh, things have evolved from there. Man, I bet, but like. You know, you're, you're, you're like the rest of us, you know, watching that, that field be assembled and, and, you know, obviously the, seeing the, I want to say like the main event out there, you know, Kipchoge versus Bekele and stuff. Like how yeah. excited are you to be a part of that? I mean, history is bound to be made there, no? Yeah. I mean, it's a pretty, pretty unreal field, especially for, um, the world's condition at this point. <laughs> I'm glad they're able to get these sort of athletes there. Um, I mean, Bekele versus Kipchoge is kind of like the matchup everyone's been waiting to see for a long time. Um, so, I mean, that's that's exciting. I'm trying not to think about it too much because I got my own own deal to worry about. But um, it is very cool. It's very cool to um, be a part of this year. So, you know, you referenced it. The the world is kind of in a funny sort of way right now. You're you're coming from from Cedar City over to there. What's uh, what's the whole chain of events, uh, you know, as far as, you know, when you have to check in and how long do you have to be there and, and what kind of precautions do you have to take? So on the 22nd of this month, I need to be COVID tested um, and, I mean, a whole bunch of other um, hoops to jump through. But and that's sort of the big main thing that needs to be done, need to have results back before I leave um, the following Sunday, so a week before the race. And so we'll fly in um, and then be basically shuttled right away to this like biosecure hotel, they're calling it. And we'll just stay in there for the week. Um, it's about, I think they told us there's about 40 acres of land. So at least there's some space there. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, we're just locked in there. I think we're COVID tested again during that week. Um, 
and uh, yeah, and then just a bunch of those 2K loops over and over again race day. <laughs> Man, so like, is is that all you have to do, like your shakeouts and stuff on? Like, I mean, like that's still quite a bit of time between then and your actual race. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I don't really, I haven't seen what the hotel looks like or what the situation looks like, um, but you know, it's, it's just part of the situation. I'm happy that a, an elite marathon exists for me to run at all, to be honest. I'll take whatever conditions they give me. Oh, for sure, for sure. Hey, taking a look at the, at the past couple of weeks, uh, you know, up on your Strava account, which people can go and check out, uh, your Cameron Levin's on there. Uh, there's a 31K uh, run where you ran 514 mile pace for, you know, an average pace throughout the whole thing. There's, you know, 29 kilometers where you ran 309 average kilometer pace there, man, like what, talk to me about those, about those workouts, uh, a little bit. I know last time we talked, it was, it was just after you had broken the Canadian record and you said it was like, you said it was a workout kind of like that, where you actually ran 520 mile pace and that's where you really got your legs and, and got the idea that, that you could run a marathon. What, what, what's the purpose of, of a workout? Like the, the one that I just described there, is it, is it the same sort of thing, like a confidence booster or like, what, what are you hoping to achieve there? Um, well, so my coach, Jim Finlayson has me doing workouts that are about 25 to 30 K, um, of repetitions. And then obviously the total distance with, Rest, warm up, cool down, adds up to more. But um, there's a few different ones <laughs> I've done, but the idea is to kind of get into that range. Um, the most recent one I did yesterday was 15K, three minutes rest, 10K, three minutes rest, 5K, all about marathon pace. And so um, I think the idea is really to like nail those big workouts and kind of recover, hit whatever sort of, um, in between workouts we can between those, those big ones. Um, and so um, I, I guess they are confidence boosters in a sense, but they're also extremely important just for fitness. Uh, they're kind of like a, a nice combination when they go well, you know, you're, it's a good sign for fitness and it's, uh, you know, you're running around the marathon pace you want to. And so, that makes you feel better as well, I guess. You know, you mentioned uh, Jim there, and we'll talk a little more about Jim in just a second. But uh, so you made the the switch from uh, a guy that you were calling your your consultant, uh, longtime coach uh, Eric Cool. Uh, yeah. He was he's your university coach, and and you when you made the switch uh, over to Jim, uh, it was it was like I said, from from a consultant to you said you were looking for someone you know a little more full time. Well, what's the transition been like? You know, have they been pretty similar in some ways, or you? know like has it has it been a pretty good transition yeah i mean it's been a great transition sorry i was just trying to think of the um differences between them i mean the marathon training is just so much different than what my college coach um you know gave me for for track and cross country and everything um and so it's, it's kind of difficult to compare them i guess in that sense there's been some pretty major changes as far as um mileage i mostly just track everything based on actual time running versus distance so you know it's like a day might be a 90 minute run and a 45 minute run um so i pretty much switched completely over to that instead of a certain amount of miles or kilometers that day um and then <laughs> the, the big thing is um i just like he he gives me these workouts that i can hardly even uh, like I guess I could have hardly dreamed up of beforehand. Um, <laughs> I keep, uh, I, I'm more used to it now that it's been kind of coming up on a year, but um, at least initially it felt like I was getting these massive workouts and I was like, how can it possibly get more difficult than this? And then the following week it'd be even crazier than the previous one. <laughs> and I'm like, this guy is trying to kill me. You know, he's, he's been super committed to me. He's trained me hard. He knows he totally knows what he's doing. Um, and it's it's really really clicked well. Um, even though it's the uh, sort of, I mean it's long distance. He's based out of Victoria. I live in Portland, Oregon. Um, he's been really good about 
um, keeping contact, giving me like the full week of training in advance. So I know what I'm doing. It's just, it's, we're very much in sync. It feels like, and so it, it's, it's been great. It's been a great transition. You know, for, for those who don't know Jim Finlayson, he's a two eighteen twenty one marathoner, a 21 or sorry, a 29, 21, uh, 10 K guy. He's, he's one of those guys who are, I, I think he has the respect of almost everyone who knows him. He's, he just seems like a, a really, really good guy. Uh, he's also a two-time national champion uh, as well, too. How did that happen? I mean, like, so you you have grown up not too, too far away from him. But, uh, you know, I'd, I'd be interested to, to know, how, how did he become your coach? How did you, uh, you know, get hooked up with him? Well, after um, the Toronto Marathon last year, uh, I kind of realized that I needed – a bit more of a full-time uh, coaching situation, just a little bit more. Um, yeah, I guess a little bit more support. I was kind of relying on um, myself for workouts and training and that kind of, you know, works well when things are going well, when you're in a bad spot, it's kind of a little bit more difficult to know what to give yourself, I think. Um, and so I was looking for a coach. Um, I, knew that Jim um, had been coaching Emily Setback hmm. and she's been running awesome and proved a huge amount over the last couple of years. And so kind of knew about that. I was talking with Trent Stellingworth uh, just about potential options as well. And he suggested Jim to me. Um, and that's basically how I made contact with him in the first place. Um, and it just seemed like the right fit from there. You know, speaking of, uh, of last year's marathon, you ran 2.15.01. Uh, I remember, you know, just, just after the event, you seemed very, very disappointed. And, you know, the, the marathon's kind of like that, where, where you put in, like, these months and months of, of build, and then it, it all comes down to what happens on a specific day. With that being said, I think someone in your position – you know, after knocking out that first one and having such a successful first marathon, you know, you, you had a lot to learn from, from that, from that 215 and, and from a marathon that, you know, didn't go quite as planned. You know, what, what are the things that, that you really took away from there besides, you know, f- finding a new coach? I mean, a big thing is just finding out just how painful the marathon can be. Um, the last 10 K of that, well, prob- probably more than the last 10 K of that was, uh, incredibly difficult and, uh, just my entire body was killing me. Um, and being a, you know, the complete opposite of the previous year, um, where I mean, like it was difficult, but, um, you know, I felt strong still during the late stage of the race. And so, I mean, there's obviously that, uh, but I don't know, I guess I kind of learned that inconsistency in, well, Actually, I guess I shouldn't even say it's something that I, I learned. I just sort of found that my inconsistency in my buildup, um, just due to a couple of different factors, really hit me hard late in the race. You know, I, I, I didn't feel like, um, I mean, the pace felt easy enough. Just did not feel like I had my legs under me um, late in the race. And just running that hard for that duration, I guess, took it out of me. And uh, not nailing those big workouts, not... Um, uh, you know, being able to consistently put in the mileage I wanted to beforehand had that effect. You know, I mean, I, I knew it could still go well, but I also knew, um, it was a possibility that things would not go well. And, uh, yeah, I guess there's horror stories with the marathon, but, um, in some regards, I think still sort of get what you deserve with the race. And I mean, um, it was a surprise for things to go that rough, but, um, looking back on the way training was going, it's not that big a surprise. You know, 2020 has just been a wild year in, in a number of different ways. A few ways that, that have really affected you quite a bit, and, and we'll, we'll work our way through the list. But uh, well, let's let's start back in March. You, man, you were in Kenya when, when basically the, the whole country set down, uh, shut down. What was what was that like? And, and like... When did you know that you had to, to make your way back home? And yeah, explain, explain that, that whole event to me. Um, well, I went over to Kenya in preparation for the Rotterdam Marathon. Um, they're in very similar time zones and, um, you know, the weather's still good for that time of year and still altitude. There's 
great number of reasons to be there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I guess I wasn't paying close enough attention to um, the growing pandemic at that point, and then just races started shutting down <laughs> while I was over there in Rotterdam. Um, was still hanging in there. Um, you know, it was one of the later ones to be canceled at that point. Um, and so I was seeing all these other ones get canceled, um, or well, canceled or postponed, post, post, sorry, postponed, I should say. Um, and I was just holding out hope. Um, and then, you know, like all the others, obviously, um, didn't end up happening. And, um, suddenly it was just a scramble to get home. Um, and I was there, um, alongside, I mean, not planned, um, alongside, but I was there with Tristan, um, would find, um, him and I were doing some training and stuff together when we were there, but he, um, was basically just trying to get out there at the same time as well. And he had been there even longer than I had been. Um, I mean, I was just there for a few weeks beforehand and he'd been there for months also prepping for London at that time too. So it was just a sort of mad scramble. Everybody trying to get out. Um, yeah. And what what was the, what were the differences like there? I mean, were, did they see this whole thing as as much of a threat? I mean, like when when did it really hit you? When when was it like was it talking to people at home who were like, no, everything's everything's going down here, or was like the feeling generally there in Kenya like, all right, you got to get out of here. Uh, it was pretty clear, at least trying to fly out, um, that they were very, they didn't have a COVID case or at least any recorded one at that point. And they're very, very nervous about, um, potentially spreading into the country. Um, and I mean, I have no idea how seriously, um, actual citizens of the country were taking it, but certainly, um, the government seemed to be very worried about it at that time. Um, and I mean, my overall trip, you know, doubled in time trying to get home with everything that was happening. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it, it was being, it was very big concern. It was actually mostly interesting. So I flew from Nairobi into, um, Amsterdam and, and Amsterdam was just a complete ghost town. Um, and then going into Atlanta, um, and just having, seemingly no precautions being taken by anybody into the U.S. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, things are about to get bad very quickly here. Mm-hmm. Um, and being looked at strangely for wearing a mask. Can you believe that now? Yeah. <laughs> now everybody's wearing one. So, yeah. Um, yeah, but it was pretty, pretty wild adventure, that's for sure. Hey, you mentioned uh, getting a little bit of training in with, with Tristan Woodfine. Tristan will be joining you in, in London. Is he a guy that, that you keep in touch with? You know, like, have you guys been going back and forth uh, about uh, London and about his training and stuff? So, I mean, we trained a little bit together in Kenya. Um, and so I got to know him pretty well there. Um, beforehand, not having really chatted with him much. Um, and I just exchanged a few emails emails with him. When I found out he was in London, I, before I was actually in, just wanted to wish him through the best of luck. Um, but yeah, I'm a, on that note, I'm really excited to see what he ends up doing. If he's in any sort of shape that he was in Kenya, I think uh, he'll be up for something big. So, oh man, that's that's super cool to hear. From one 2020 disaster to another, you're uh, you're currently in Cedar City right now. Uh, you call Portland uh, your your home right now. Portland is uh, they're in a bit of a predicament uh, right <laughs> now. Um, yeah. Talk to me about your your time in Cedar City. I mean, like we we talked a bit beforehand about this, but you know how did how did those plans come together, and did it have anything to do with the the obviously very bad uh, air quality there now? Um, so at the time it was, uh, not related to the air quality. Um, and I mean, in fact, when I left Portland, it was completely fine. Um, it was just, I left just to try and get altitude somewhere. And I so suddenly got into London, London, um, that we were just trying to find, you know, an altitude spot that I could sort of quickly get set up in without much advanced planning. And you know, I, I know lots of people here in Cedar City, so I was able to get set up pretty well, um, relatively quickly. 
and so yeah i ended up um just driving out here and um and then everything started happening well i shouldn't say everything uh, the wildfires started encroaching on portland and um obviously the air quality is the worst in the world there right now um and so i just kind of i, I don't want to say happy coincidence because it's not happy you know my my wife's still back there having to suffer through it but it's very fortunate from a training standpoint to be out of that and cedar city stayed relatively clear you know even compared to um lots of uh, utah in general october 4th is the london marathon you're going to be there um you know perhaps this uh, this would be a good time to uh to talk about your, your shoes a little bit there you're still with uh, with hoko one one what's uh what are yeah. the marathon uh shoes like uh coming out of there is it is it going to be something something new or you know what what are you wearing um well ideally i'm going to race in the um same shoes as the americans were using at uh, u.s trials um u.s olympic trials earlier in the year uh, and they're great shoes i i don't currently know the status of them um whether they are legal yet or not but um if i can't do those i'll be using just the same ones that i've used previously um for the last couple marathons um but ideally i get to use those ones they've been super super cool feel great um i have no idea how they compare to anybody else's super shoes but um uh, i've really liked them so far how, how do they compare to what did you run the record in? Was that the carbon rockets? How, how do they compare the to rockets. those? Um, I like the feel of them considerably more, even just comparing like one upper to the other. Um, you know, even that feels more comfortable. Um, but yeah, I mean, it feels like an improvement in pretty much every regard. And as, um, given the choice, I would choose them every single time over the carbon rocket. Hey, you know, one last thing to, to leave you with, uh, yesterday as a, as of recording this, it was, uh, it's been 20 years since, uh, since Simon Whitfield won gold, the gold medal in the, in the Olympic triathlon. Uh, he was a guy who would have been training not too far from, from where you grew up when, when you were growing up there. What, what, what did that race mean to you? I mean, that, that last run is still so amazing to watch, you know? I mean, Simon Whitfield, his, his run every time in the um, uh, triathlon is always just unreal. Um, and I think both times he's medaled, he's fallen on the bike as well and had to uh, make it all back up in the run. So it's kind of hilarious how that goes. Man. But it's just, yeah, an incredible, incredible performance. Um, and yeah, very, very inspiring. Um, I don't know if I have the same memories um, of it actually happening at the time as maybe others do, but um, I'm very, very aware of it happening um, and very, very impressed with uh, his career in general and obviously that race. So. Oh, for sure. Hey, you know, I will leave you with this. Uh, last week we, we talked to Farah Abdul Kareem and uh, he was a guy who, who believes in, you know, watching watching races to inspire, but, you know, also pump you up. I know there's a lot of runners who are kind of in that same boat. Uh, you know, is, is that you? Is, is there any go-to races that, uh, that you usually watch that, you know, you can, you can pull something from? Um, I'm not sure whether, uh, I'm trying to think of, I don't know if I've necessarily watched lots of races for inspiration. One of my favorite races to watch though of all time is, uh, 2003 world championships, 5k. Oh, um, that's a good one. Yes, it is a very, very good one. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I don't know whether it pumps me up or not, but I think we just, you know, it's a very cool race, very um, fun sport to watch in general. You know, I, I love watching track and field. So, yeah. <laughs> All right, October fourth is the is the London Marathon. Cam Levins is going to be there, and uh, really hoping for for that Olympic standard. I, th I know for sure you are. I know the the rest of us are as well too. It's been uh, it's been really cool to to watch all the progress on Strava again. Cameron Levins, you can search him up on there. But uh, hey, man, best of luck, and uh, like I said, we're really cheering for you, man. Thank you, appreciate it. 
That was our conversation with Cam Levins. We are super happy to have him on, especially before he takes on the London Marathon on October 4th. If you like this episode, be sure to shoot us a subscribe on whatever platform you're listening to us on, whether it be Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or YouTube. Also, if you could share with your teammates, that's really how we keep this thing going and can really spread the word about this show. My name is Michael Rokas. You've been listening to The Terminal Mile. And remember, any way that you can, support your local Twilight Meet.